A question was emailed into Ryan at BeyondThePolls.com. I would like to know if the King James Version is a reliable version of the Bible. Now, the best thing would probably be to learn Hebrew and Greek and read the original documents, but that's uh, more or less the pursuit of a lifetime. So looking at the English translations, there's all kinds of them, NIV, the King James, New King James, and the list goes on and on. One of my favorites is, of course, the one at the top, the New International Version. But a lot of Christians will only read from the King James Version and claim that it's uh, that this is the English version that's inspired by God. Personally, I think it's best when studying the Bible to uh, look up the verse in all the different translations. So here's one of my favorite verses, Genesis 6-4. And uh, here I can just read what the verse means and all the different translations, which if we look at the easy-to-read version or the expandable Bible, there's a lot more information than... Uh, just the one verse. So that's probably the best thing to do. Just look at it and all the different translations so you're not relying on a single one. But on the King James translation itself, King James uh, really had nothing to do with it. It was just in his empire. And it was a group of, it says here, 47 scholars and clergymen. And the overseer of the project was Richard Bancroft. And Richard Bancroft and the 47 scholars and clergymen seem to have been involved with the Rosicrucian movement. This is the original King James Bible from 1611. And would you look at that right now? It has 33 favorites. But I'm not going to dig too deep into the book. Let's just look at the front cover. We can zoom in and see some closer detail. But on this one, there's some distortion... It's not that good of a picture. So here we have a much better copy. And it's the title page of the original 1611 King James Bible. Right off the bat, nothing, nothing's popping out too much. You can see Moses with the Ten Commandments and nothing too sinister. But let's dig in a little bit deeper. I'm going to start down here at the bottom with this pelican or goose that's uh, feeding its children. Here's a better version of that. It's a well-known Rosicrucian symbol. Also uh, connected to Freemasonry, obviously, and the rose with the cross, signifying the rosy cross or the Rosicrucians. And the pelican has a self-inflicted wound, and from that wound, it's feeding the young. Alchemy was central to Rosicrucian beliefs. One of the most common alchemical symbols was the pelican. As Manly Hall explains, The pelican feeding its young from a self-inflicted wound from its own breast is accepted as an appropriate symbol of both sacrifice and the resurrection. To the Christian mystic, the pelican signifies Christ who saved humanity through the sacrifice of his own blood. To the Rosicrucians, the pelican represented one of the vessels in which the experiments of alchemy are performed and that the red blood is the mysterious red tincture, the Philosopher's Stone, by which the base metals are transmuted into spiritual gold. The pelican was often shown under a rosy cross, as seen previously. So to the Rosicrucians, this is the, this is the Philosopher's Stone. Here's another one with the rose and the cross, self-inflicted wound feeding the young. And last but not least, here we have a Masonic apron, 777 at the top, the rosy cross with the self-inflicted wound feeding the children. Notice here how the bird is pure gold and a reference to the alchemical process. Now back to the King James Bible, we have Rosicrucian symbolism, the bird with the self-inflicted wound feeding the children. Now we got a bull sneaking his head in, and that may be a reference to Moloch. Here is a 18th century depiction of Moloch with a very similar head. Of course, it's the head of an ox. And with just the head peeking in, I couldn't see his arms. It's, you know, maybe this is a, a reference to that. A phoenix down here. And a phoenix with his wings raised up like this, 
are quite often associated with Freemasonry. The original United States seal had a phoenix instead of an eagle, and that phoenix, whether as a single head or the double head, is often associated with Freemasonry. Going up the page, we have Moses with the Ten Commandments and his staff. And over here is Aaron. So these guys are brothers. Moses and Aaron are brothers. We know it's Aaron because of the seal on his chest. Exodus chapter 28. Make the frames of gold with two chains of pure gold. And make it into a breastplate. Set it in mounted stones. Four rows of stones. The first row... It's going to have three colors, the second row, three more colors, the third and the fourth row. And those 12 stones uh, correspond to the 12 tribes of Israel. You'll see it in pictures of Aaron. Here we go, the 12 tribes of Israel with the two gold chains. Another view of that here. And we can identify Aaron by this great gold piece with 12 rare gems on his, uh, on his necklace piece that has two chains going to it. I mean, rappers to this day are trying to replicate this huge necklace, but the original guy, the original two chains with the large golden necklace really goes back to Aaron. So certainly Aaron here, but what is down here? Here we go. Looking at the bottom of his robe, a bunch of one-eye symbolism. All of these are one eyeball and probably the left eye. I zoomed in even more to get a closer look. But the one-eye symbolism is right here on Aaron's robe. Now, previously I had shown this picture of Tartarians, Muscovites, and Tartarus. So, Tartarian men. And all of them are making a certain hand symbol where the two middle fingers are together. He has it, he has it, this guy has it, and he has it. So, wasn't quite sure what it meant. But Tartarians are making this hand symbol... And I found Christopher Columbus doing the same thing. Two middle fingers together. Not sure what it means, but I was curious why Christopher Columbus was making a hand symbol. Just like I had seen on the Tartarian depiction. So I thought it was probably just a coincidence. I seen Aaron's hand doing the same thing. The two middle fingers are together. But let's look over here. Here we go again. The lady who's holding the book. Two middle fingers are together. But that hand symbol seems to be popping up again and again. Up here, most likely. Maybe it's uh, just artist coincidence. But here are the two middle fingers together. And even up here, not quite as noticeable. But uh, two middle fingers together. While there's a little bit of a crack here. So... I'm going to leave that one for what it is. Not quite sure what that means. But right above it, we have the 12 tribes of Israel. Each uh, tribe having their shield. And going up, there's various figures here. Along with the ineffable name of God. Which I'm not sure is good or not. The Rosicrucians are certainly using it here. And this is from Morals and Dogma from Albert Pike, but it's explaining the Hebrew language and how these two words, Huahia, which means he, she, would be written as this and this. Because the ha at the end gets dropped off, and you're just left with ia uh which is the Tetragrammaton, or the ineffable name of God. And sometimes it's expressed triangularly, and perhaps it is the ineffable name of God, but it seems that this is he, she. Now, in the sense of a creator, that kind of makes sense, because you have both the he and the she 
And the two coming together, of course, is what has the creative power. But as I was looking at this image, I noticed the guy in the background here in the shadows. And he is uh, right central. I mean, this guy is, you know, kind of more prominent, fate, closer to us. And this guy's a little bit closer. But this guy's in the center. So zooming in on him, just a shady looking character. And what is he holding except a square? I don't know what the hole on the head over the pineal gland is. But definitely a shady looking character right here. Hiding in the shadows and holding his square. If I didn't know better, I would think it was a symbol of the secret Freemasons hiding in the shadows. But at the same time, right there in plain sight. Of course, the sun and the moon are always important alchemical symbols. And this guy over here... I didn't know if maybe it was Genghis Khan because he does look a little oriental uh, in comparison to the rest of the guys who all seem to have, you know, white hair and Mo Moses type of looking characters. But, you know, over here, a much different looking man looking more oriental. And I, I was curious if that may have been a representation for Genghis Khan over here. And not a far stretch, because here we have the 12 tribes of Israel. Of course, at this point, we know that Genghis Khan was a descendant of one of the 12 tribes, one of the 10 lost tribes. So what I consider the 1611 King James Bible some kind of uh, absolute piece of work inspired by God, uh, I would say no. It seems to have Rosicrucian influences on it and as far as i'm concerned there's uh undeniable rosicrucian uh, symbology all over this uh, entire front piece of the bible now is rosicrucian connected to freemasonry let's let eliphas levi answer that question because he is an expert on magic kabbalah and alchemical studies and occultism Eliphas Levi, the initiate, who wrote to a student, Now we can give each other a fraternal embrace of the rosy cross and address each other this greeting of true adepts. Peace be with you, my brother. May peace be with you and with your worthy mate. So Elias Levi obviously embraces the Rosicrucian uh, just as much as he embraced Freemasonry, Occultism, Kabbalah, and Magic. Now here is the 1560 Geneva Bible. And I was unable to find Rosicrucian and Masonic symbolism on this Bible. And in addition to that, it comes with a whole wealth of additional knowledge, including side notes, preludes, maps and uh, illustrations all throughout the book so if i got to make a recommendation on one single version it would be this one but it is quite better to just read many different translations form your own opinion and when it comes to individual words like this one here the sons of god uh, go get a concordance and look up those individual words and find out what the hebrew and the greek word is and we're instructed by God to study his word, so let's keep reading for knowledge. 